So I think what we need to do is to ask what do oscillations do for neuronal computation? The way to think about it is that if you have a lot of neurons firing mm -hmm. like crazy and look at the population activity, you don't see any modulation. But if you now start to kill off neurons every 100 milliseconds, you start to see a rhythm emerge. Some years ago, I, I, I started to get big doubts. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, and that is because... This is Brain Inspired. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul. Ola Jensen is co-director of the Center for Human Brain Health at University of Birmingham, where he runs his Neuronal Oscillations Group Lab. Ola is interested in how the oscillations in our brains affect our cognition by helping to shape the spiking patterns of neurons and by helping to allocate resources to parts of our brains that are relevant for whatever ongoing behaviors that we're performing in different contexts. People have been studying oscillations for decades and finding that um, different frequencies of oscillations have been linked to a bunch of different cognitive functions. Some of what we discuss today is Ola's work uh, on alpha oscillations, which are around 10 hertz, uh, so 10 oscillations per second. And the overarching story is that alpha oscillations are thought to inhibit or disrupt processing in brain areas that aren't needed during a given behavior. And therefore, by disrupting everything that's not needed, resources are allocated to the brain areas that are needed. So we discuss his work on attention in that vein, you may remember the episode with Carolyn Dicey Jennings and her ideas about how findings like Ola's are evidence that we all have selves. <laughs> we also talk about the role of alpha rhythms for working memory, for moving our eyes, and for previewing what we're about to look at before we move our eyes. Um, and more broadly, we discuss the role of oscillations in cognition in general, and of course, what this might mean for developing better artificial intelligence. Show notes are at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 160. For those of you interested, I have reopened my online course, NeuroAI, The Quest to Explain Intelligence, which you can learn more about through this short video series on the website at braininspired.co, um, where you can also learn how to support the show through Patreon to get full episodes uh, and to join our Discord community, or just to make a contribution um, by other means if you value this show. All right, thank you for being here. Here's Olga. Uh, so Olga, you, you have studied oscillations uh, in the brain for a long time now. And I, I feel like that phenomena, oscillations, uh, kind of waxes and wanes in popularity um, in the neurosciences writ large. And I'm just curious, I thought I'd start out by asking you what your view on that is or what your experience has been you know has funding been harder in, in certain years and have people's interests wax and, and wane the way it seems like from the outside yeah no it's, it's a bit difficult to say because um i've always surrounded myself with people who are interested in oscillations sure so yeah, <laughs> yeah i i started out um looking at the hippocampus, looking into hippocampal data, but also doing modeling on the hippocampus. And there you see these very strong theta oscillations. So I think in that part of the community, there's not really a doubt that oscillations are there loud and clear. Um, so, so then I think there's also regional differences. Um, so so uh, I worked in the US, did my PhD, and there are people somehow seems a bit more skeptical about oscillations hmm. than in Europe. Um, Less so. Um, I don't know exactly what makes that difference. Uh, so, so sure, it has sort of vexed and vain over time the interest in oscillations, but there's also seem to be some interesting regional differences. I hadn't thought about that. Where are we right now? Are we at a, a peak of interest in oscillations? Are we at a trough, or or what? Um, I, I think. I think um, th there's a lot of excitement for oscillations, sort of. Is, is sort of being rekindled. Um, and I think also um, oscillations are many things and, of course, occurring in different frequency ranges. Yeah. Um, I, I think so, so. So there's also sort of when, when interest vacs and veins, 
it it also depends on what frequency band you are looking at. <laughs> so 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 back in the in the nineties, uh, when people talk about the binding theory, that okay. these gamma oscillations, say from forty to hundred hertz, were, were thought to be important for binding. The focus of it was very much on on gamma oscillations, and I, I think now people are getting more and more interested in in in, in a slower type of oscillations. So. So theta oscillations from five to eight hertz, alpha oscillations from eight to twelve hertz, and, and beta oscillations. So maybe there's sort of a slit shift down in, in, in frequency in terms of interest. <laughs> yeah, I guess it uh, the scale waxes and wanes too. You're you're an alpha guy, right? <laughs> or an alpha male, I suppose I could say. And we, so we'll we'll end up talking a lot about uh, alpha, and I know that's not all you study, but um, yeah, just staying with the big picture for a moment. So spikes are easy, right? Because they're pulses and you can count them. And oscillations are more slippery, I'd say, like like neuromodulation, right? Because there's different analog like levels and then you have to pull out the, the power within some range and you have to choose that range. And um, so, so this leads me to the question of just what what your kind of overall worldview is regarding the you know the causal role of oscillations the are they are they more constraining how they're you know how they interact with spikes and how spikes interact with them are are they mutually causal and then throw neuromodulation in there like how it's just harder to think about, for me it's harder to think about this super dynamic process of oscillations and how it what role it plays like how do how do I like really um have a clear picture in my mind about how it's interacting with the spikes and what it all means. Yeah, so it's a very good question. So, so um, I mean, first of all, we think oscillations are a group phenomenon, right? So, so they are a consequence of the neuron spiking in a synchronized manner, but also in a rhythmic manner, right? So the, the, the oscillations follow from that. Yet, I will also argue that the spiking of individual neurons is driven by the group activity, the oscillations, right? So the example would be that if you have an audience and after a concert, they might start applauding. And then when you start clapping, suddenly you hear they start to, to, to clap in a rhythmic manner. Yeah. So when thinking about that, each individual is driven by the population activity, right? So it's really the oscillations the group activity exercising a causal e effect on the indivi in individual, but it's all the individuals together that creates the oscillations. So, 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 from that perspective, it's difficult to make a clear causal direction unless you think about the individual neurons at a time. Hmm. Um, but I, I can also tell a little story which was very lightning for me when when thinking about oscillations because. I started out by looking at EEG and MEG signals, and there we see the oscillations loud and clear. Um, but of course, we want to link them back to, to, to the spiking activity. So I had this uh, PhD student, Saskia Hakens. She was studying the, the somatosensory system. Um, she started to discuss with Ranolfo Romo in Mexico, who was recording from non-human primates in the somatosensory system and that had they had all these wonderful spike data mm. and and were investigating the different aspects of that um, they also had the local field potential data right uh, but they have never really looked at them so what Saskia did was that she flew to Mexico set up the collaborations and started to analyze the data and what we saw was that when the spikes the neurons were spiking the spiking was tightly locked to 10 Hertz alpha oscillations. Mm -hmm. But if you looked at the individual spikes, you did not see much of an oscillation. Uh, the firing rate was not very high, so, 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 so you didn't get this oscillatory pattern. But if you look at the power spectrum of the local field potentials, a clear uh, peak at around 10 hertz. And also, when we looked at how the spikes linked to the phase of these oscillations in a local field potential, we saw that the spikes were very clocked by, by these oscillations. But but individual neurons weren't necessarily clocked, but among the population of neurons, they were clocked? Is that what you're saying? Uh, but rather, when a neuron fired, it fired at a particular phase of these oscillations, but the firing rate was not 
that high. Oh, so yeah. So yeah. so you wouldn't see the rhythmic pattern alone because it would be skipping cycles. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it wouldn't fire on every cycle. So what the spiking wasn't rhythmic. Yeah. I mean, that's the idea. Is like when the, uh, a an oscillation is happening and um, there's this peak, right? And it's the, at that peak that it's maximally allowing uh, or or kind of nudging spikes toward firing or allowing them to fire or, or not repressing them or something uh, or depressing them. Um, but but this interaction then right between an oscillation and spikes you can't you can't mess with an oscillation without messing with the spikes and you can't mess with spikes without messing with the oscillation so i just want like a a clear picture in my own head about how to think about that relationship causally and what what it means for our cognition and the way and brain function right like which is which should i think is more important for for instance right yeah I mean, so so the causal uh, discussion becomes very difficult, right? Because it is indeed possible to entrain these oscillations. For instance, by rhythmic flicker in, in a 10 hertz span, you can entrain alpha oscillations. You can also do transcranial stimulation with current also at 10 hertz oscillation and entrain these oscillations. And then you can show that they have effect on cognition. You can show that these oscillations are inhibitory. However, then one can always argue back and say, hey, these are not the same kind of oscillations as occurring naturally, mm -hmm. right? So that makes the, 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 the causal discussion quite difficult. But nevertheless, our starting point is that these oscillations are there loud and clear, right? The alpha oscillations are the strongest signal in the ongoing EEG or MEG also doing task. So to me, at least that warrants that we should try to understand what they are doing. And it also begs the question on how the neurons, they are working together in order to produce the oscillations. Mm. Um, and in my mind, the fact that the spiking of the in individual cells are timed by the phase of these oscillations also mean that the oscillations would have an impact on how these neurons, they compute. The word constraint uh, keeps ro rolling around in my mind. Do you think of them more as constraints or more as... Ca I mean, constraint and causality are kind of intertwined as well. Constraint could be seen as a kind of causality. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of how powerful you, you see oscillations in terms of responsibility for brain function. <laughs> yeah. I like to think that they are part of organizing the neuronal coding. So, so to give another example, um, so John O'Keefe, um, he got the Nobel Prize for finding play cells. Mm -hmm. uh, namely cells in a rat hippocampus that fires when the rat is in a specific location. So he also did another very important discovery, and that is this notion of phase possession or phase coding. So when you look at the firing of the play cells and relate them to, in this case, ongoing theta oscillations, and these are these oscillations being 5 to 10 hertz, and they are super strong in the hippocampus. So you, you see them with the naked eye. You cannot miss them. But what they then did was to relate the firing of the play cells to the, to the phase of these theta oscillations. And as the rat moves through um, a play cell, you see the firing happening earlier and earlier in the theta cycle. So that, that now means that it's possible to take a collection of play cells and then reconstruct where the rat is. What you now also can do is that you can take the phase of firing into account and then you can better predict where the rat is. Mm. Right, so that that means when we talk about the oscillation constraining the firing, um, we can also think about the phase of in which the cycles they fire coding for information. Um, so, so of course, I cannot prove to you that the brain is utilizing this phase organized code, but at least when we look at the, the data themselves, we can do a better job at sort of reading the rats or mind of where the red is by taking the face of firing into account. If I use the word uh, oscillations are suggestive to neurons, is that too weak? Um, because, you know, neuron, neuronal firing is highly variable itself. And then, of course, with, yeah. with oscillations, which I, I'm going to ask you in a second, I mean, we, we have these terms that are supposed to, like, denote clear bands of oscillations, but really it's happening... There's bits of oscillations throughout all of the frequencies, right? 
And so that's kind of noisy and not, you know, it's not as clear as alpha, beta, delta, et cetera. Um, but is, is the word suggestive uh, of when to fire? Is that too light? Does that, does that not give enough credit to an oscillation? Well, I, yeah, what one would say that it changes the probability for when a, a, a neuron fire or not. Um, but I, w- I would also say, personally, I'm, I'm quite sort of signal to noise driven. Mm. Um, I study alpha because we see it. And um, also back to that, the theta and the alpha oscillations um, in respectively rats and, 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 and humans, they, they are so strong, right? So mm-hmm. in my mind, and it, it's very hard to come up with a cognitive task where you do not see robust modulations uh, in the alpha band. Uh, so to me, that also speaks to the notion that these oscillations must be important for when neurons they fire or not. Yeah, but one of the things I always found frustrating about um, thinking about oscillations is, you know, it, it, it seems like you could take any frequency band and relate it to any cognitive function that you want. Um, it, it seems like, so it's hard to, you know, when you think, um, when, right now in my conversation with you, I'm thinking alpha. That is uh, attention and working memory and, you know, and then like you were saying, gamma, oh, that's the binding frequency. But then there are a thousand different stories um, about how a thousand different frequencies relate to a thousand different cognitive functions. I mean, do do you think that we're going to get to a point where we can kind of keep in mind and, you know, when I think alpha, I should think X, right? And when I think beta, I should think X. Or is it just that because the brain is so complicated and complex that we're just going to have a really long table of different cognitive functions that they interact with and how they interact with them. Yeah, but again, <laughs> I will, I'll go back to the, the sort of signal-to-noise argument mm. and then say, if you, for instance, do a working memory task, we see a very robust modulation in the alpha band, not so much in a beta and gamma band, right? Mm-hmm. So, so that sort of constrains the, 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 the issue and the interpretation. So, so of course, your, your search space or data space becomes larger when you consider frequencies. But, but it's not, it's not, we don't see these re- modulations robustly in all frequency bands. They, they often seem to be constrained to very specific bands. Hmm. Um, a couple more broad questions before we actually start talking about uh, the interesting work that you do. Uh, are they oscillations or are they traveling waves or both? Yeah, very good question. So, uh, when we look at intracranial recordings, for instance, with ECOG, that's where you sort of put a grid of electrodes on the neocortex. On the brain. Yeah. There, yeah, there, there, there you see very robust traveling waves. Um, if you look at hippocampal recordings, there's also reports on the theta oscillations traveling down the hippocampus. And I, I think that's, that's, um, I, I think, um, it is it it's 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 I, I wouldn't say obvious, but it's like you have all this excitable tissue, and then if there's a generator generator oscillating in one part of that tissue, it will always be strange if you didn't have waves sort of emerging out from that. Mm-hmm. The thing is, we we have not been very good at quantifying these waves in the context of of cognitive tasks. Right. But I, I strongly believe they're there, and I believe they're important. But it's first now we sort of are getting the technology with the multi electrodes in animals to record this thing mm. and 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 to observe the waves at the scalp level at, at humans in eg and MEG data is, is is a bit problematic because we have the volume conductions and every sort of everything sort of blurs together right yeah has your faith in oscillations as a major function uh, this is a totally unfair question i know has has it ever waxed and waned has it have you ever faltered in thinking because you you know you're really uh focused on oscillations yeah so 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 at least some years ago i i i started to get big doubts oh okay <laughs> yes and that is because um you are starting to look at more natural tasks where we allow participants to circuit and then um, we see that people circuit three to four times per second. Mm-hmm. If you now have an alpha oscillations being at 10 hertz and sort of think about the alpha oscillations doing um, clocking of the processing, then it's sort of odd that you have a relatively low oscillations, 10 hertz sort of 
meaning 100 milliseconds per period, and then you saccade three to four times per, per second, right? It, it doesn't seem like a very intelligent design to, to, to use a bad expression. But, but um, what's then safe, the whole story, is that we now find that often your saccades are locked to the face of these alpha oscillations. And then things start to make sense again, because then you can move your eye um, in the period where the alpha oscillations are not processing, so to speak. And then when your eye lands, you have the visual information coming in on the excitatory phase mm. of the alpha oscillations. So the, the eye movements are kind of nested within the alpha. Exactly. Yeah. And, and what made me nervous before observing that was that, that we studied these oscillations and they're actually quite slow in frequency compared to how fast we perform or our visual system operates. Mm. Um, so, so your doubts were because of the timing of the oscillations relative yes. to the spikes, but you never, you never thought, yeah. uh, like some people claim oscillations are epiphenomenal. You never uh, had those kinds of doubts. Not really. Um, I have to admit, uh, because we see them so loud and clear when recording EEG and EMG data. And, and again, it's very hard to come up with a task where you don't see robust modulations. Um, so at least to me, that warrants that at least some of us should um, be investigating them. Then it's all well and fine that, that some are skeptical and say they are able phenomena, but and then with time, you will sort of resolve the issue. Is that are those uh, U.S. Uh, scientists who say they're epiphenomenal, and the, and the Europeans say no, they're they're not epiphenomenal? Is that the is that that divide? Right. I, I, I I wouldn't say there's an Atlantic <laughs> divide like this, but but I mean there's more sort of trends, right? Oh, okay, okay. Um, so one more question. I'm I'm going to ask you a little bit about um the relation of some of your work to artificial intelligence later, but uh, artificial yeah. intelligence and more and more you know the cognitive sciences and um think of brain functioning in terms of algorithms and objective functions and you know these sort of um, very computable, straightforward um, uh, sequences of computational steps. Do oscillations uh, throw a wrench in that? Are, are oscillations uh, amenable to algorithms or can you know can we integrate them into the story about an algorithm or do they complicate that story in a way that maybe can't be saved? Um, so so, so there's two strands to that question. So, so first, I very much agree with the sort of algorithmic view. So I think what we need to do is to ask, what do oscillations do for neuronal computation? Right? So, so we shouldn't just sort of correlate them with whatever function. We should really go in and ask, is there some uh, processes, computations that can be done better with oscillations than without oscillations? And, and what we are thinking now is that the uh, 10 hertz theta alpha oscillations in humans and as well as the hippocampal 5 to 10 hertz oscillations, uh, theta oscillations in a rat, but they are, they are inhibitory in nature. So they're pulses of inhibition. Mm -hmm. So what you should imagine is that the peak of that inhibition, all input, are being blocked, but as the inhibition ramps down, the most excitable and then the second most and then the third most excitable representation would fire. So what these oscillations then give you is almost like a filter that then allows only the most excitable representations to slip through, but furthermore they are organized as sequences according to importance. So if you go back and think about O'Keefe and this theta phase coding and theta phase position, one can construct models where you have these sequences being read out. Uh, so the, these are spa spatial representations organized according to um, excitabil excitability or sort of how far they are from the rat's upcoming positions. Um, furthermore, for the visual system, what we also speculate is that when they're competing visual input, only the most Excitable input should go through the visual system. Furthermore, they need to be organized in a temporal code according to importance, if you will. Mm. 
And this is what the oscillations they provide. They inhibit, and when you ramp down inhibition, you get the activation according to excitability. So that's, that's sort of the algorithm uh, we think that these oscillations are doing. But this is very much a temporal algorithm. And you know, if you, if you take like a deep neural network, uh, you don't care about time. I mean, do you, I'll yes. just jump to it then. I mean, are yeah, we going yeah. to be able to build, quote unquote, strong AI or human-like AI without this kind of uh, temporal aspect built in, whether it's built in via oscillations yeah. or not? And yeah. do you think we should just, just build in oscillations or, or that kind of timing mechanism? Yes. So, so, so um, we are right now playing around with, with different deep neural networks trying to do exactly that. Oh, okay. um, so, so, yeah, so, I mean, you're, 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 you're completely correct. When one consider deep neural networks or convolutional neural networks, they do not build in time. Right. Um, and, and if we then want to relate what's going on in these networks to the temporal dynamics as measured in humans and non-human primates, we cannot do that. So we have some ideas for how to augment deep neural networks to incorporate time. So we call it uh, dynamical deep neural networks. And what we also want to do is to uh, put in these inhibitory oscillations in the network. So the way you should then imagine is, imagine this is that we present the network with multiple stimuli. Uh, so it could be a cat and a dog, but presented at the same time. But what the network then does is to break that image up into a temporal code so, so you have that, a cat dog, cat dog coming out in your end, mm. and it's these inhibitory properties of the oscillations that would serve to convert the parallel input into a temporal code. How do you add the oscillations in? Are they are they just a, a function of the firing of the neurons, and they emerge from that, and then and then affect the neurons themselves? Yeah, so step one is that we simply impose them. So, yeah. so we assume that there's a pacemaker driving it. So, so I guess what you're getting at, do they emerge from the, from the network itself? You put them And in. of course that would be, yeah, it would be very elegant if they then emerge from, 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 from the network, right? But that would then be the next step yeah. to, to, yeah. <laughs> it's so complicated and messy. I mean, do you think, obviously, you know, if you have robots, they need to operate in time. Um, if we're, we go beyond like deep neural networks, um, and and if you want human-like uh, artificial intelligence and to be interacting with humans, timing needs to be pretty e exquisite as well. And you know, robots moving throughout the uh, world. So, you know, in in the future, with uh, really great AI robots, are we going to see oscillations as part of that story? I don't know. No, oh, uh, so on. because uh, to... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, so, because, I mean, so far, what we are doing is that we are taking deep neural network, and I, I think it's amazing what they can do and how the representations emerging in these deep, deep neural networks can be mapped on to, to human or non-human primate brain activity. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so I think something is, 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 is correct about those for how, um, representations are being formed. So, so now we are sort of exploiting that work to make a model of the human virtual stream. So um, one could then imagine that also when doing that process, we get inspired for how to improve the networks and, and in a machine learning sense. And then that would be an application that could be useful for, for robots. Hmm. Um, but so far, I have no idea for, for how to go the other way, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Interesting. All right. So um, maybe we should talk a little bit about Alpha. Your Is, is Alpha your favorite uh, frequency band? Uh, not by choice, <laughs> but, but uh, that's somehow it, the, the data drove us. Yeah. So um, maybe you could t just take us through, uh, you know, there are different frequency bands, many of which you've already mentioned. And I guess Alpha, the Alpha band, which is uh, around 10 hertz, was the first to be at least... Um, uh, noted right by hans berger and it uh, used to yeah. be called what was it the burger burger band yeah the Ber burger rhythm Ber burger rhythm that's right um yeah. and it's you know classically uh, or well you you should correct me but historically um it's been associated with things like um drowsiness well uh 
uh, internal thinking, internal cog- cogitation, um, and sleep, and things like that. And how has that? How has the story of Alpha changed over the years? Yeah. So so um, so I mean, it goes back to 1924 when 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 this Hans Berger he identified the the alpha rhythm as we call it now, right? Um, and then. Um, there were quite a few investigations, uh, but most of them also concluded that alpha is associated with rest, right? So if you close your eyes, alpha becomes strong. If you, if you become drowsy, alpha becomes strong. So, so, so possibly alpha oscillations have also gotten this connotation of being somewhat boring, right? <laughs> and uh, also, um, electrophor- electrophysiologists working with, with, with uh, non-human primates were not particularly interested in, in, in alpha, right? Because why would you study something that just pops up when, when nothing is going on? Um, but, but then what happened was that um, sort of in the late 90s, um, people look at the alpha in working memory tasks. And there's a paper by Wolfgang Klimisch where he report that alpha is actually relatively strong during um, working memory retention. So he referred that to that as paradoxical alpha. Okay. Um, so yeah, so 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 we were also doing some studies, and that was brought me into the field where we looked at the alpha rhythm with working memory load, and what we saw was that the alpha oscillations were becoming stronger and stronger the more you kept in working memory, right? So the more difficult the task, the stronger the alpha rhythm, right? And um, we thought we got the triggers wrong and so forth, but we checked it in all kinds of ways and it, it, it held up. And it turns out that it has now been reproduced many times. So that brought us to think that maybe alpha is not about rest, right? Mm-hmm. So also in line with what Klimisch had proposed, um, we, we, we put forward the notion that the alpha oscillations were inhibitory. Uh, so during working memory, that would mean that um, when you sit there and have to retain something in working memory, in order not to have interference, the visual system is shut down by the alpha rhythm. And that was later tested by doing different kind of tasks where we introduced distractors that people could anticipate and we could show that the alpha oscillations pop up before uh, these distractors are occurring in order to suppress the distraction. So, so the idea is like the alpha is um, okay. Well, there's a few ideas here, right? So, one, the first thing that you mentioned is, you know, the stronger the alpha, the the more the more you can hold in working memory, um, and yeah, and that that is uh, and please correct me. That's because if you have like a really strong peak, more neurons can fire, and the neurons firing is an analog of things that you can hold in working memory. Um. That was one hypothesis we entertained. And the other hypothesis was that um, the alpha oscillations would, in this case, generated in visual cortex. Mm. So they were shutting down visual cortex in order to allow, say, more frontal regions to maintain the working memory representations. So it's not a... a t- I thought the story was that it was a top-down control mechanism where frontal areas uh, produce this alpha and that alpha is, you know, travels to or is um, manifested in visual cortex, and that is a suppressive oscillation in visual cortex, so that you're not getting in- incoming stimuli, so you can remember the phone number over and over, right? Because I don't want to be distracted by incoming yeah, yeah. St- stimuli. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that 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 I would agree in. But then you just said that v- that the early visual cortex was producing the alpha. Um. Yeah, but um. The alpha has um, an inhibitory effect, if you will. So, so, so the way to think about it is that if you have a lot of neurons firing mm-hmm. like crazy, and look at the population activity, you don't see any modulation. But if you now start to kill off neurons every hundred milliseconds, you start to see a rhythm emerge. Right. So, mm-hmm. so. Um, of course, if you kill off all the neurons, you don't see anything again, right? But there's sort of an inverted U shape. So the way we think about alpha being generated is actually by having 
neurons not firing every 100 milliseconds. So that also explains why the alpha rhythm increases in power as the neuron firing goes down. So, so the, okay, so this, this gets back to that, that interaction, right? Because I, I thought that the alpha was in training them in this rhythmic way, um, and by doing so, sort of disrupts the incoming stim, stim, um, stimula, stimulation, sensory stimulation. But then you're saying that, no, it's, it's the neurons themselves that begin to fire uh, rhythmically, which allows the alpha to have more of an effect. Well, there's a difference between sort of the alpha being generated in the network and then what you measure. What you measure is most likely the summed activity of parameter neurons. And um, that is a consequence of um, oscillatory activity coming in and then silencing uh, the parameter neurons in, in a phasic manner. So then you are left with sort of like collective bursts uh, occurring every 100 milliseconds. But the stronger that inhibition, the, 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 the shorter the duty cycle mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for the neurons to fire. Um, and then that would emerge as a stronger peak in your power spectrum, albeit the total neural firing is going down. And, and that is the signature of um, keeping at bay sensory stimulation. Yes. So it's so then you have um so so the old story of um sp sequences of spikes firing at different phases along the peak of the alpha wave, um signifying however many things you're keeping in uh, working memory. That story. What's the um, status of that of that story? Yeah, yeah. That so so that 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 then that does become complicated <laughs> uh, because I mean that, that was a story initially developed for. Uh, theta oscillations, mm -hmm. um, and and um, there is some support from that from intracranial data now, where we have been looking at ECOG data, and then in this case we see eight hertz oscillations, um, in in which we have multiple working memory representations activating on that cycle. Mm. Um, but but I have to say it, it, it it's not a very clean picture, right? Because I mean eight hertz is just in the boundary between theta and alpha oscillations. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Is it's yeah. like we we speak as if there, there, there's this clear line in, you know, in theta and alpha, yeah, yeah. but it's you know two two hertz or something. So, you know, I was going to ask you, and we'll come back to this later about individual differences in uh, in reading and how that um, and your your work on um, studying oscillations and reading and predicting. But I, you know, I'm curious about individual differences in. You know, something like working memory, right? So everyone has different capacity for working memory, although we're all kind of the same. And it just seems strange. It would seem strange to me that everyone is operating in the same regime, that it has to be at 8 hertz. It seems like um, Jessica might operate at 8.5, or that might be her best oscillatory uh, regime regime for, uh, you know, working memory. And, and um, Philip might do better at uh, 10 or something. Do, are those individual differences clear? Or, and if so, like, what's the range? Or are our brains just so exquisitely uh, evolved that we're all operating at like within these narrow bands? Yeah, so so I think if 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 you go to a particular individual and measure them repeatedly, you will find that their frequency is is quite stable. Uh -huh. However, there's individual differences, um, as as you refer to, and some people have been able to to show that these individual differ differences in alpha frequency is. Is, is important for how people sort of com combine um, uh, uh, things in time. So there's these paradigms where you either can integrate or separate um, two objects depending on how close they are presented in time. And then people with slower alpha oscillations, they, 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 they tend to uh, integrate more than people with fast oscillations. Mm. So there's these individual differences. Is it better to have a big brain or a small brain? <laughs> human yeah yeah I, I i don't know because i mean there's also the, the some people are also trying to find link between the size of the brain and the alpha oscillations mm -hmm. um I'm, I'm not up to date on what the findings are but mm. but there's these ideas around 
So, I mean, just on a personal note, so, sometimes I wonder, and this is maybe this, an oscillation story with me, sometimes I think that I think very quickly, but unfortunately not very deeply. Uh, and so I can think on the fly very quickly, but then I, I feel like I'm uh, lacking depth in my thought. Whereas some people that I've observed who seem to process things more slowly uh, can also seem to process them more deeply. That's a really naive story. I just worry that I'm a very shallow, quick thinker. That's the that's the issue. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> so so I don't know. I listen to your <laughs> podcast, so so oh, I don't I don't I don't share that concern. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Leave it, leave it at that. So I can continue to worry about that then. Well, so, I mean, we've, we've touched on working memory and um, let's move on to attention because again, so the story in working memory is that alpha has this suppressive role uh, in suppressing um, distractor information coming in. And, and I'll link to all these studies, you know, that, that you uh, work on and, and your lab website for people to learn more about the gritty details and such. Um, I had... Carolyn Dicey Jennings um, on the podcast a f few episodes ago. I can't keep track now. Uh, and she's a philosopher and she's, you know, written about using the evidence of alpha oscillations as a, as a, an, um, an inhibitor, uh, as evidence for um, that attempt and its role in attention specifically as evidence for a self that we have a uh, self. And that's a very loose way to describe uh, her detailed work. I have no idea if you're familiar with uh, any of her work, but or if you have a comment on on the relation between um, alpha and attention and the self. Um, but we but then you've done a lot of this work, you know, showing that alpha has this um, inhibitory role in attention as well. Yeah. So so I mean so so I guess I'm more comfortable about talking about. Uh, attention and alpha um, and inhibition, and then maybe we can return to the self. Oh, um, sure. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. So, maybe so, we so, can. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so. So. I mean. So. So. The, the the studies for alpha and attention are, are somewhat simple in the sense that we simply ask people to fixate, and then attend to something to something to the right, and then um, ignore what what what's to the left, and what we then see is that. Alpha contralateral to what you should attend to is depressed, but in the other hemisphere associated with the distraction, the alpha increase. So that has sort of become a workhorse paradigm for the alpha oscillations. Uh, so I should also say here, but that, that does not mean that each time you see alpha modulations, it has something to do with oscillations. So mm -hmm. we like to think that alpha is always exercising this inhibitory role, but attention is sort of the workhorse for, for, for getting that out. Um, so what we would like to do is to generalize this to, to, to other brain regions, and maybe that's where the, the larger discussions come in. So um, now it turns out that if you look at intracranial recordings, you, um, uh, you also see alpha oscillations in other regions than visual regions or somatosensory regions. If you do language tasks, you see alpha modulations in the language areas like left prefrontal cortex. So what I would like to think is that alpha is ubiquitous. Mm. And what it actually does is to allocate resources in the brain. So, so I mean, maybe to, to um, say something which is wrong, but um, there's a saying that we only use 10% of our brain. <laughs> uh -huh. But we can modify this to say that we only use ten percent of our brain at a time. Okay. Yeah. So, but it's so still the point wrong. being is it's still wrong though. Yeah. It, it's still wrong. Yeah. It's still wrong. The ten percent is wrong. Yeah. But but uh, maybe it's within rings. The, the 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 point being that if all brain regions were active at the same time, there would be sort of information overload. Uh, your brain could not function, right? So. Um, what we like to think is that alpha in general is inhibiting all the brain regions not involved in a given task. And then the alpha activity is decreasing in the regions um, doing the, the processing itself. And this is not only occurring in the visual system, but it's more general uh, within the full brain. So this is speculation, but, mm -hmm. but it's sort of consistent with, with the, the different observations we are making. So it's resource allocation by saying, all right, kind of um, uh, just always telling everyone to stop except for the relevant um, networks that need to be 
uh, highlighted or, or um, taken advantage of at the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this begs the question, and I'm sorry to just jump to this, but how... So you use the word attention, right? And it's the, if we think of attention as a cognitive uh, function, like a mental cognitive function, I mean, then where does that come from? If, if alpha is uh, indicative of this process of attention, in other words, how, do, how does the controller, let's say it's alpha, know how to control? Yeah. So indeed, there's been a lot of debate about this. Um, and what we initially thought seems wrong or not always correct. So we thought that alpha was under top-down control. Mm. So if you have to attend to something to the right and there's a distraction to the left, we thought that alpha would increase or your right hemisphere to um, uh, uh, sort of push out the distraction. So it has been difficult to find evidence for in general. There's, there's some indications, but in general, what we actually see is that it is how much you are tending to the target to the right that then results in the alpha increasing uh, in the non-target hemisphere. So to me, that suggests that some regions are being engaged and then through some sort of lateral inhibitory mechanism, alpha is increasing in the non-engaged regions. Um, so this is also consistent with, with the perceptual load theory of, of Nelly Levy, who has made this point that it's actually very hard to, to um, suppress distraction. It's a bit like, don't think about the polar bear walking in <laughs> the door to the right, right? Uh -huh. um, but, but what you can do is to, to focus your attention to the left, and through that, the alpha activity associated with the door to the right is increasing. So I, I'm going to have you do a task, right? So I'm going to give you instructions, and it's an attention task. And I'm going to say, you're going to be cued about what to, which side to attend to or something, right? So that's externally, I'm, you're getting my instructions. Um, so then you think, okay, there's a top-down thing. I need to do this. And then while you're doing the task, then you're getting this sensory uh, stimulation of like where the cue is going to be. So that is uh, bottom-up driven from our senses, um, and I, you know, the question is, who's doing the the doing, right? How does that then turn into yeah. the the controller, the um, resource allocation, the the alpha that's helping us to attend? It's an impossible question right now, isn't it? Yeah. So, so I mean, so, so I mean, so the cop out here is to say it's prefrontal cortex, right? But go. then yeah. it almost becomes like <laughs> a humongous notion, right? Yes. Yes. So I mean, I mean, so so at least we would like to think about prefrontal cortex, sort of. Um, doing a top-down drive to um, engage the regions that are involved in what you attend to. And then there's a secondary mechanism mm. in which alpha increases in the regions not being involved uh, in the task, right? So, um, so it's like... I, I have not... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, so to say, but, but by that, I have not solved the watching problems of how to kill the humongous, right? That's right. still that, that assumption. But it's assumption, almost, yeah. so, so you could tell a story, maybe I'm going to rephrase what you said and tell me what I'm getting wrong. So there's like a mechanism, you know, you have this top-down control from prefrontal cortex, but it's not actually controlling the early visual cortex. There's an inherent, uh, let's say, self-organizing Mechani mechanism, quote-unquote, in, in like, let's say, the early visual cortex that then just kind of allow it's allowed to be activated within itself that then, so it's a sort of internally self-organized driven way of inducing alpha and shifting attention. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. So you, yeah, you engage one region and through some sort of lateral mechanisms, uh, regions not involved, that's when the alpha increase. So I want to talk about uh, frequency tagging. Uh, this is a, yes. it's a really interesting method to use. And, one could say disturbing on some level, perhaps. Um, so, so what is frequency tagging in terms of oscillations, and, and how do you use it? Yeah, so, so, so um, it's something we are quite excited about because um, what we can do is frequency tagging above 50 hertz. So frequency tagging has been used at slower frequencies, um, and the idea is that um, there might, you might present a participant with a visual display, there's two objects. One you flicker at 10 hertz and the other one you flicker at 15 hertz. 
And lo and behold, you can see a response in visual cortex to the flicker at 10 and 15 hertz. And then when you attend to the 10 hertz object, you see an increase in that signal, right? Mm -hmm. So that works like a charm. The only issue is that it's really annoying to see these flickers. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you're interested in alpha oscillations, uh, then <laughs> if you start to flicker at 10 hertz, you, you, everything gets messed up. Yeah, you're blinking a lot. And, but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but what we have been able to demonstrate is that the visual cortex um, responds to flickers up to 80 hertz. But you, don't you so, have like so, a super, super fast um, projector, though, that goes like way above uh, 80 hertz, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we, we have a, a so-called ProPix projector that can go at 1440 hertz. Um, so, so that's really cool because we can sort of manipulate every pixel on the screen mm. at arbitrary frequencies that's crazy. almost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, um, what we then can do is that we can have multiple objects in the visual scene and we flicker them at different frequencies and then we see the response in visual cortex. And that response, uh, and, and as you also mentioned, that flicker is invisible. Right, so it's above flicker fusion, so 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 you don't see that manipulation. Yeah, and and then we can have uh, multiple objects in the visual scene, and and then we can sort of um, uh, manipulate attention, if you will, um, and then measure the response. So so the the question is, so so why do we do this? Right, so so um, the thing about these fast flickers is also we can sort of measure the changes in neuronal excitability on quite a fast time scale, right? Uh, because um, if, if we flicker at, at 60 hertz, um, every cycle is, if, is 15 milliseconds, right? Hmm. So within 30, 20, 30 milliseconds, we can see if the attention is, is changing. Um, so we do this because we want to move uh, towards investigations using more natural stimuli that people can also saccade around. Mm. Um, so what we now can do is to also look at the frequency tracking um, to objects before people are moving their eyes to that object and then see when people start to move their attention um, and, and, and how much attention is being allocated before people move their eyes. So again, the idea is that you can tell... Um, about the attention because more of the of the uh frequency tagging more of the uh the uh the hertz that from the side that you're going to attend to attend to gets through because the other Correct. frequency that you're tagging at is is uh repressed yes yeah um yeah you you mentioned the um so well you mentioned being able to predict um well first let me back up because you know, we're talking about timing a lot, and then, and then I started to think. You know, we think of attention as just a uh, a function, but does attention have a timing? Like how quickly we can allocate our attention, and is that is that? A, I don't even know if that's a, a story. Yeah, no, uh, it's a great question because it's something we have been really bothered about. Um, and the thing is, we do our good old attention experiment. So we pop up a cue, attend to the left. That queue is on for a few hundred milliseconds. Then we wait a second or two, and then we pop up some objects for a few other seconds, right? Mm -hmm. However, um, so, so, so we do our task over multiple seconds, um, and we tell people not to, um, to, to move their eyes, right? Yeah. However, in daily life, all of what we do is to move our eyes around, right? Uh, so it's about three to four, four, four times per second, right? So we have get thousands and thousands of saccades um, within not so long time spans. So so now it turns out that that um, of course some research has been done on that, right? But if if you think about what we know about atten mod attention and modulation and brain responses and stuff, is always over much shorter time scales, and these shorter time scales do not fit well. With something that happens that has to happen within say 250 milliseconds, right? Yeah. So if you move your eyes three to four times a second, you have 250 milliseconds to play with. So within that time window, your attention, you 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 first have to sort of process what you fixate at, but then your attention also has to move to to where you want to move your eyes, and there might be several objects you want to select from, right? 
all this to happen has to happen within 250 milliseconds. Um, and that to me, that's a big conundrum. And that also means that we need the tools and techniques to be able to study what's going on in the brain with, a, with quite a mm. fast uh, time scale. But this, this is, uh, I thought you were just going to go right into talking about your pipelining um, yes. model or mechanism. So let's talk about that. Before, before you do that, um, you know, so we move our eyes with saccades, which are these ballistic large eye movements. They can be large or kind of small. And we talked about how that was uh, locked into the alpha um, phase. Uh, is the, is the same story? I should know this. I bet I bet a previous colleague of mine already published something about this. Um, are are micro saccades? So we we were constantly making what are called micro saccades as well, and that's like these little jitters yeah. of eye movements, right? That so that your whole world scene doesn't change because you're barely moving your eyes. But are those also locked uh, to alpha? Do you know? Um. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. So th that's work by uh, Fake Van Ada and Kian Obra, where they are able to show that um, if you sit there and you you attend to the left, you simply cannot help making these small micro to the to left. The left, yeah. And yeah, and 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 then your alpha oscillations are also modulated. Okay. Uh, so 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 and th there seems to be a correlation there. Uh, so, so to me, that speaks to a coupling between the saccadic system, the saccadic motor system, and the alpha alpha oscillations, um, and and um, so so at first that might sound a bit mysterious because we thought alpha was a visual rhythm and so forth. But then thinking about it, of course, the saccadic system and the visual system have to be tightly coupled, sure. and they also need to be timed in in terms of their processing. So it's a speculation, but we would like to think that the alpha oscillations are very much involved in in doing that timing. Man, my, seriously, my previous ad advisors are going to kill me for not just knowing this off the top of my head. I'll edit that out. I'll edit that out. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead. no, no, but that I mean, these these are new findings, right? Yeah, in in a sense that that um, it, it it's relatively reason that people are starting to look into micro circuits yeah. and, and the alpha oscillations. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I had uh, colleagues in my lab looking at micro saccades, but I, I couldn't remember if they tied them to oscillations, so I'm, I'm hoping not. Now I'm going to have to look it up when we're done uh, speaking here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, okay, so you were, we were, when we were talking about attention, you were talking about the allocation of attention and being able to predict where attention um, would be allocated by, by looking at these uh, alpha. Um, and then we were just talking about, you know, the timing of attention, and you said that that was a big problem. And, and that brings us, uh, I think this is a good time to talk about that pipelining mechanism that I mentioned a moment ago. So um, what, yeah. is the, what is that pipelining mechanism, and how does it relate to the timing of attention? And, and uh, maybe, I don't know if this is, uh, we could segue into also the studies on reading that you've done. Yes, certainly. Yeah. So, so, so I mean, the setup for this is, 250 milliseconds between each saccade. You have to squeeze in both the processing of what you fixate and you have to squeeze in the planning of the saccade and the pre-processing of where you want to move your eye. How can that all happen within 250 milliseconds, right? So, so, um, we think pipeline is involved. So, 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 so what do we mean by that? So imagine two people doing the dishes. One is washing and then passing on a plate to the other person who's doing the drying and then putting the plate aside, right? Um, so, um, of course, if they do this in a fully serial way that um, the guy washing is not going to take the next plate before the guy drying is done, um, it would be slower as compared to if they somehow work in parallel. So when person two is drying, then person one is picking up the next plate to uh, to 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 wash, right? Mm -hmm. So so this this is I mean uh, it, it's it's this sort of the essentials of we think about pipelining. So there's several processes going on, but at different levels of the hierarchy. Mm. So the way now to think about it for the visual system is that um, it could be that you fixate on an object. The first, the, the the low level features are processed, maybe in 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 V four, right? And then that 
processing of, of that object is moving on to object selective cortex and it's then being categorized as um, an animal. That then leaves open before to process the next item, mm. um, which then can move on to object selective co cortex, which is, is now done with the first object and so forth. So exactly like washing and drying, um, in the visual hierarchy, um, there's processing of multiple items, but at different levels of the hierarchy. So that allows you to both process what you fixate at, but then it also opens up the resources to when that has been processed in early visual regions to do the previewing um, in early visual region for where your eyes are going to move next. And in my mind, it's simply not possible for the visual system to operate unless there was some sort of pipelining going on mm. because there's simply not time to do every item processing sequentially. Yeah, so, so that, I mean, we, we often, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's old news that the brain operates in a parallel fashion, right? But yes, then yeah. when we think of something like the uh, ventral visual stream, we always talk about it in terms of, well, first V1 processes lines and edges, blah, 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 and then it gets up to higher, you know, objects, and then we can categorize it. But then we never talk about the dust that's left behind, and that's, it, it sounds like a sequential pr um, processing. So first you see the chair, and then nothing happens. Yeah. And then you see the car, yeah. and then nothing, nothing happens. But, but I like this idea of, you know, at every step, um, in the wake of some sort of visual processing, there is then an opening of resources to do other things and what you're saying, preview uh, other things. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's also the possibility that everything is going on in a fully parallel process, right? So the two objects, the cat and a dog, is being processed at the same time and sort of passes through the hierarchy. But that also creates a bottleneck problem Due to the to, due to the hierarchical organization of of the ventral stream, mm. and and that's why I would like to think that this pipelining mechanism allows both for sequential and parallel processing at the same time. Is this so? Go ahead. Yeah, I should say th this is so far um, speculation, right? So we don't have the evidence for this yet, but that is what we are trying to to establish now. But, but going back to the. Sorry. No, I just so I don't know if you're going to talk about yeah. reading, but I, it just made me think of you know yes. the um like the convolutional neural networks that you talked about that you guys are working on and implementing oscillations in them. Um, is is pipelining a part of that story as well? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, because the next question comes like um so just again imagine the two people doing the dishes. I mean they better be coordinated, right? Otherwise things goes wrong and and plates would drop. So how is that coordination achieved? Well, then we think it's by means of these alpha oscillations that, that that's 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 doing the temporal coordination. And earlier you mentioned traveling waves. So we would like to think that there's this traveling wave in the ventral stream that sort of carries the representations through. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so uh, is any of that published on archive? I haven't seen that, or or have you published anything on that? Yeah, so so we 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 have a a, a text paper uh, where we speculate on this. Ah, okay, okay. But but again, uh, we are still in the process of trying to to find the empirical evidence. Uh, do you want a postdoc? Are you hiring? No, I'm just kidding. I'm really kidding. <laughs> Um, so this reading uh, work that you have done, and this maybe leads naturally in, into talking about the reading. Um, one of the yeah. one of the take homes is that faster readers are uh, better at previewing the upcoming word. Yes. So can yes. <laughs> I'm a really slow reader, so that's bad news for me. But uh, but maybe I, well, I'll ask you later about comprehension and how that uh, it comes into the story as well. But um, yeah. yeah, what have you found uh, in terms of reading and predicting upcoming words when you're looking at a given word, et cetera? Yeah, so so that that's back to this thinking about the pipelining and the frequency tagging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 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 now it turns out that that um, we want to study sort of natural vision and visual uh, exploration of, of of natural scenes and how you comprehend those. It turns out to be uh, difficult, right? Because um, oh. the objects are not well quantified and stuff like that. So going to reading is actually um, 
also a good stepping stone for that uh, because it's easier to that the words in sentences are, are better quantified and you only make saccades uh, in, in, in one dimension, right? So um, what we have been doing is to um, first look into um, uh, the saccadic times. And it now turns out that from the Ive movement literature, um, it has been studied for many years um, how people are doing previewing. So basically, if you focus on word number n, and you have word n plus 1, how much do you preview this before you move your eye? Now it turns out that how long you fixate on word n is independent on the word frequency or how difficult the n plus 1 are out there that you are previewing. Mm. So that has resulted in different models being sort of quite sequential uh, in, 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 in the nature. So um, we sort of challenged that sequential view of reading by using the frequency tagging because what we're doing is that we're flickering this word out there in periphobia, in the periphobia, the N plus one word that you're about to move your eyes to at 60 hertz. And what we see is that um, for more infrequent words, the more difficult words, there's a stronger frequency tagging as compared to more easy words. So this suggests that if there's a difficult word being out there in periphobia, there's more attention being allocated to that. So this is, uh, to us, evidence for the notion that um, you're doing the periphobial processing during reading. So it's sort of a more, um, uh, so, 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 so it sort of forces a more parallel view mm. uh, of, of, of reading. Is it attention or previewing? Right. So, so you're you're going along, you're your uh, phobia, it's like you're you're reading the word yeah. claustrophobic. No, I'll say that. You're reading the word uh, I, um, and then in the periphery, you're not at the word claustrophobic yet, but that's a, a, an infrequent word. So the sentence is, I am claustrophobic. Yeah. Uh, and claustrophobic is uh, an infrequent word, and you're saying that the attention attentional resources are greater uh, to claustrophobic. Does that mean, so are you previewing it more then? Yes. Yeah. But but it, in this case, I would say covert attention and periphoral previewing is is one and the same. Uh, so so okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, so what we are getting at is that we want to take the tools and experiences we have from investigating spatial attention, covert attention, and then apply it to more real life examples such such as reading. And and reading is all about fixating, allocating covert attention, making us a cate. And just to throw this in there, because I think it's an intriguing uh, result, uh, we were talking about the timing of attention. And one of the things yeah. that you found is even if you present these words really uh, slowly, that the the attentive previewing happens just immediately, even if there's even if it doesn't have to. Yes. Yeah. So and 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 this previewing. It, it it happens within, so you fixate at word N. Even then, the previewing effects start to occur 100 milliseconds in, right? So it really sort of changes how we think about the speed of the visual system when we're working with these more natural settings. And then really frequent words like uh, the... Um, it's not that they necessarily get skipped. Is it? Is it just that they get? Um, you don't need to allocate much attention to them because they're so automatic, because they're so frequent that it kind of. Well, how? What is that mechanism like? How do we kind of skip over the word "the" but still know it's there and etc. Basically, yes. So, 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 you you would not linger too much on "the" when your eyes actually move to that word, and often you would even skip it, right? But even Skipping that word also implies that it it has been previewed. Hmm. Okay, so so I, I started this little segment off by saying that um, faster readers have better previewing ability. Essentially, yes, yes, yeah. Our slower reader. I, I don't know if you've tested for comprehension on the material yeah, being yeah. read, but our do slower readers have better? Uh, how does this interact with um, the, the comprehension of reading? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's also a very good question, right? So, so I mean, there's this joke about a guy who took a speed reading class and he said, I, I read War and Peace overnight. And then his friend, like, 
ask him, so, so how did you like it? And he says, well, I don't really remember, right? <laughs> right. So, so th there's the point. Right? I mean, of course, if you read really fast, you don't comprehend uh, too much, right? But um, so, so, so in this particular study, um, we check comprehension, but not sort of on a graded scale. But the typical finding is that um, faster readers are also better readers and also better comprehenders. Okay. Unless you really push people very hard, so they, 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 they then they, they, they change around. But in general, it, uh, fast readers are also better readers. So, so it's, again, I'm coming back to individual differences. I'm wondering if there are different uh, types of people who read fast but comprehend really well. Some people who read slow and comprehend better than the fast readers, etc. Like, how much stock should we? How nuanced are these effects? Do I, does this mean that I should work harder to read faster so that I can comprehend better? Or it, does my comprehension lead to faster reading? Like, what should I do? Yeah, so, so I don't know. Uh, so so I, I have to say I'm not a reading expert, right. but we are collaborating with, with reading experts. But the questions you ask are something, some, some, some questions we would like to be able to answer with our techniques. So we also sort of can apply our approaches also to see if we can um, come up with, with, with strategies for teaching people to read better and more efficiently. We also want to take this to, to, uh, to children to investigate when do they start to preview mm. um, and is that related to their comprehension and can we through that also come up with strategies for how to teach them to, to possibly read better. Mm. I was going to make an analogy to like our conversation here in terms of predict, you know, I can predict what you might be, what you might, what I might predict that you're going to say next, right? But it, it's different because I have to wait till, until you say it to verify it. But when I'm looking at a scene or reading something, I'm constantly predicting upcoming, I can, I can preview the upcoming words. So, I, so there's that kind of prediction of what word might be upcoming happening. And at the same time, yeah. you have this preview uh, going on. And yeah. as I'm reading, I, I'm, I read to my kids every night, you know, and they're fairly, you know, simpler books. So I'm like really like predicting kind of far in advance the like what's semantically going to happen, conceptually going to happen. And then I'm also previewing these words. How far out does that previewing um, happen? I guess out to the as far as your paraphobial will take you, right? Yeah. So, um, so, so. We, we don't know, but we think it goes more than one word, maybe two or three words. So that could also explain why you see the previewing effect at already at 100 milliseconds. But but you mentioned something which is also very important, and that is uh, prediction. So so in, in a study, you, you referred to, we were very careful about having words that could not be predicted because we want to take away the prediction effect. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. However... Of course, predictions are important. Um, so now, um, Yali Pan, so she's the, the postdoc doing these studies. She's now running a study in which um, she's specifically looking into uh, the prediction um, and how that affects the paraphernalia processing. Hmm. And our hypothesis is that if you actually can predict what's coming up, you um, allocate less attentional resources to that word. So often when I'm reading, and sorry to ask you these, but, you know, have these personal anecdotes and asking you the questions, but, you know, it happens very frequently, especially reading to my children, that I will be, I'll still have like a full line below, right? So I'll be on the next to last line of a page. Uh, and then I can, without reading all the words, uh, I can be on a word and I don't know if I'm taking it in, in the periphery, but I can close the page, turn the page and still complete the sentence and the next line that was on that previous page. So then it's almost like it's uh, staying in my working memory or something. So you have this working yeah. memory component in addition to the previewing yeah. and the predicting. Yeah. So so I, 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 I guess that there's the previewing and, and then also sort of reading ahead uh, silently before you uh, sort of speak out loud what you read, right? And then there's the working memory coming into play as well. But can you read ahead in the previewing? I suppose you. All, I suppose that that's what previewing is in some sense is reading ahead. 
Yes. So, but the, the, the question is whether you, how much you read ahead without moving your eyes, right? So, I mean, right. you can also move your eyes and read the sentence and then keep it in working memory and then uh, sort of say it out li- loud. You know, there are the scientific journals that print and old, like, classic books print in these, like, really narrow columns. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even, you probably know this, you know, what's the difference between reading like that and not being able to preview as much linearly anyway out to the to the right if you're uh you know if if that's the way that your language goes versus these which is equally um uh there are equal difficulties in the um publications where it's really thin single spaced lines but very wide uh margins so you have to like read you know 50 words for every line versus reading like four words for every line line in these like thin columns so, you know, does this speak to how we should print? <laughs> Possibly. I mean, so, so again, I'm not the expert here on that, but, but there must be some sort of an optimal medium where the columns are not too wide and not, not, not too narrow, right? Personally, I find it quite annoying if the column is too narrow. Oh, right? it's like too... three words and yeah. every other line has a hyphen. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. I wonder, yeah, yeah. I'm surprised they haven't uh, changed that. I won't name publication names or anything. But... <laughs> mm-hmm. So, okay. I was going to ask you, I'm glad that we brought up uh, predicting as well, because I was thinking about how to relate these findings to the transformer mechanism in artificial intelligence yes. and these large language models and how essentially yeah. they can, they, well, so I'm sure you, you're aware of the studies that um, relate large language models predicting the upcoming word, right? And, and then yeah. If it has a high enough uh, predictive probability, then you know these the ones that generate language will then insert that high most highly predicted word. And I'm sure you know about the studies in neuroscience um, with MEG and EEG and fMRI um, being you know doing this linear transformation to map on and say, oh yeah, that's what our brains are also doing. Uh, we can decode our brain yeah. activity such that they're predicting. So how do you think about this in terms of you know the predictive ca- capacity of of the transformer attentional mechanism? I should ask you about what you think about attention as well, um, and this this previewing, this paraphobial uh, ability. Because so, just to insert one more thing, you know, transformers, you know, you can do everything in parallel, right? So I don't know that there is any advantage in previewing. It's like they have infinite previewing or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so so so. First of all, I mean these. Um, that's language models, right? I mean, they, they work brilliantly at capture statistical properties of of the text and i, I think they are they're, they're an excellent tool for 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 also doing brain imaging type of, of of neuroscience um so so if you look at sort of classical psycholinguist uh, studies um is all about sort of making the perfect data set and controlling every sentence in the words for for predict for, for predictability and and and, and what have you right so 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 um so when psycholinguists they work they they spend a lot of time on making these perfect data sets. So that's all well and good, but of course if you want to study more natural language um uh then um there's an issue of how do you quantify the properties of of the different words. And then I I think tools like uh, GPT 2 or 3 are brilliant at at quantifying say the pre- predictability of specific words um in 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 whatever text you take right so so um as you also mentioned people are doing that now to sort of look into what signatures of the brain activity reflects the prediction in relationship to these specific words mm-hmm. so so as a tool uh for quantifying different properties of the words in natural text uh they they, they are excellent um, but I guess what you're also hinting at is um, is our brains doing something similar than, than, than these uh, uh, large language models, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's a lot of discussion about this uh, topic these days. Um, certainly, the architecture is very different, right? From from <laughs> I would imagine how the, how the neurons they do it, but that does not necessarily mean that they might not have similarities in, 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 in how they function. But take, take for example, previewing, right? So yeah. should, should I think of preview, previewing as a 
So it's a, it's a great thing because I can see what's kind of coming up next, but it'd be even better if I could see uh, the rest of the chapter all at once coming up next, yeah. right? Um, and so should I think of previewing as a limitation that a large language model, for instance, overcomes? Or should I think of it as something that's like integral to our human-like intelligence and therefore should be considered more in terms, you know, like like building oscillations into large language models or something or, or into deep learning models, right? Or any type of AI. How should I think of previewing it in that respect, do you think, and attention? Yeah, at least sort of previewing a prediction when you're reading. I mean, you're probably also building up expectations for what would be coming up yeah. uh, in the next sentences, maybe not word to word, but sort of conceptual from a more conceptual point of view, right? Yeah. So you're, yeah, so so so, and 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 then you sort of match those expectations uh, with the actual text as, as that un, un, unfolds, um, and then then you might update your expectations if 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 they are wrong, right? So so, but then that sort of gets into the realm of 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 predictive coding, right? And how these updating mechanisms are operating. All right. So um, in, in a moment, we'll, we'll have a little extra time uh, so I can ask you some questions that some of my Patreon supporters uh, have sent in. And also, I just have a few extra questions for you. But what are you, uh, what are you excited about these days? Are you excited about, uh, I'm sure it's more than one thing, but uh, it's one of the things like building these oscillations into uh, the deep learning type models. What, what else uh, can we look forward to? What, what's exciting you these days? So what's is really exciting to me is a new type of MEG system, right? So we talked about EEG where you measure the scat potentials. Mm -hmm. With MEG, we are measuring the magnetic fields um, generated by neurons in a brain. Typically, we use sensors that are immersed into liquid helium, so they become superconducting and we can measure these tiny, tiny magnetic fields. It works like a charm, but if we want to study children, for instance, the heads are too small for these MEG systems, so they just bob around. Mm. Um, furthermore, the, 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 the sensors are also sort of a bit far from the frontal lobes because you lean back. So now it turns out that there's a new type of sensors called optically pumped magnetometers. And um, they, with those, so, so, so it's, it's by an optical technique where you can measure also very small magnetic fields. And these sensors do not require to be uh, cooled by liquid helium. So um, several groups are now making these so-called OPM systems to uh, measure the brain activity that, like an MEG system would do. But you can put the sensors closer to the head so mm. you get a better signal to noise. You also can measure better from frontal regions. And in particular, you can start to study children much better because you can adapt the helmets to the individual brain sizes of the children. So I'm quite excited about the prospects of now developing an OPM system for investigating children. Also, to get back to oscillations, um, we know that alpha oscillations, they change in frequency with the lifespan. So if you take like a, a um, say, four-year-old child, they might have the alpha oscillations being six, seven hertz, and then they accelerate to about 10 hertz when the child is like 10, 12 years old. Ah. So if, and, and if you were to go back to the causal issue mm. of these oscillations, well, now if these oscillations are changing in frequency uh, over that sh short lifespan, uh, we can also ask how does that impact uh, your, your, your processing, um, your visual processing, your attentional processing, and so forth. Um, but we talked about reading. We can also use this system to now investigate previewing in children and when children start to preview as a consequence of, say, maturity and when they learn to read fluently. And is that previewing important for fluent reading and so forth? But the, the speaking of, you know, causality, right? The developing brain... Uh... All these synapses are developing and being pruned, and you're you know you're still myelinating, and the structure is slightly changing. So there's still that causal interaction that is kind of an open question, right? Yes, okay. uh, the, yeah, but but we can still. I mean, if you have a hypothesis about what the alpha frequency is doing in a given cognitive task, um, then we can also ask how does um, the performance in that task 
change as the frequency of these oscillations hmm. are changing. I, I know you're also interested in dyslexia and studying that. And what, what's the uh, hypothesis that do so? Dyslexia has long been underdiagnosed, I guess. And I know you're not a medical doctor, yeah. but all my children's friends mm. seem to have dyslexia. And I don't know if I yeah. do. I don't, I don't, so many people probably had dyslexia and just were, were not helped uh, because it was under, yeah. um, underdiagnosed. Are dyslexics not previewing or is, is it a previewing malady? What, what's going on? What, what's, the, what's your idea? Yeah, also, also a very good question because th th there's also this debate uh, in the field that what are the root causes of dyslexia? And I, I think there's a strong consensus that uh, children diagnosed with dyslexia, dyslexia has a problem sort of mapping the words onto sound, right? So it's in that translation from the text uh, to phonology uh, where there are problems, mm. and that's also what they are being trained on. Then there are other people who would argue that dyslexia is about spatial um, attention problems mm. um so so um now there's different kind of this dyslexia right so 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 both could be correct yeah but one going hypothesis is that um children with dyslexia um have to work harder on each word in order to do this mapping so they oh. do not preview so it's not necessarily a spatial attention problem they have at first, but they pro process every word uh, one at a time. So it's a very serial processing. However, through that, um, they do not train themselves in this sort of spatial allocation of attention during reading. So that would also explain why some people find spatial attention problems in children with dyslexia. So the idea... Again, this is a... Hy go, that's, a yeah. that's a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. Yeah. yeah. So the idea would, um, because attention is a limited resource, and so if they're allocating that limited resource more to each word, then they then their previewing is disrupted. Exactly. Yeah. And and then they don't get trained in the same extent as compared to children not having dyslexia in allocating a spatial spatial attention, mm -hmm. and then you might find a gene on spatial attention deficit, or be the root cause. Is problems in in mapping text hmm. and phonology. Oh, that's interesting. So, Ola, thank you for spending time with me, and uh, I appreciate you explaining so much of your work and talking oscillations with me. Here's to oscillations in their continued um, waxing in the pantheon of phenomena <laughs> to study brains in cognition. So, thanks for being with me. Yeah, thanks very much. It was great fun and and, and a really good discussion. I alone produce Brain Inspired. If you value this podcast, consider supporting it through Patreon to access full versions of all the episodes and to join our Discord community. Or if you want to learn more about the intersection of neuroscience and AI, consider signing up for my online course, NeuroAI, The Quest to Explain Intelligence. Go to braininspired.co to learn more. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. You're hearing music by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you, thank you for your support. See you next time.